Thank you. you know, I've gotten a lot of uh, awards over my years, and I, you just witnessed one of the greatest honors I've ever gotten to be introduced by Sarah. What, what, what an incredible young lady she is. Ah, oh, it's going to make me cry. Um, <laughs> let's start with this. And uh, you're, you're more or less familiar with it. It's our planet Earth. It's, it always makes me uh, amused that uh, some surveys have been, been done. National Geographic did a bunch of them. And uh, many people on this, in this uh, country, you could show this uh, picture to, and they wouldn't recognize it as our home planet, nor would they be able to tell if they were taken by aliens into space where to put them back on this planet, because it's unfamiliar. You know, it's an amazing image, and it's not one that we're uh, guaranteed to have. It's, it's got to us through technology, and there's some good things and bad things about it. One is we take it for granted. You know, you look at it and you go, eh, it's Earth. But, Think of all the effort that went in to get that image, to get it into outer space, to turn around and look back at our home planet. Think of the power as a species we have to look at our environment where everyone before us and after us pretty much lives on that one planet and this one planet. And therein where we get, we get in a little bit of trouble because that's a snapshot of Earth. You know, Earth is this incredible dynamic place. And when you think about everything going on, hurricanes, floods, droughts, this doesn't necessarily capture that because it's just one sixtieth of a second or whatever the exposure was of this planet. Think of all the things going on. Everything's going on on that planet. We were there when this, when this picture was being taken. You know, there's some, we don't know this planet well at all. We really don't, and we need to. And from what we've learned over studying this Earth, we, there are some headlines that have emerged. One, and probably the most important one, is that this planet has been changing for, since it's been created. For about five billion years, this planet has been changing. The face of the Earth changes constantly. It's called plate tectonics. We have earthquakes and volcanoes. The climate's been changing constantly. So it's dynamic. It's always moving. And it's in our own best interest to learn how to work with Mother Nature. We see some of the re results recently about what happens when we try to go against Mother Nature. Not a good idea. So it behooves us to study this planet. Part of the problem is this, is that what I do, I'm an oceanographer, I'm gonna show you some fantastic creatures in a minute, but I want you to take a gander at this. That's the Earth, that's the Pacific Ocean. Look at how much of it is continent, and look how much is blue. Okay, 70% of the Earth covered with water, 70%, so it's an ocean planet. Average depth's about two miles, so that's most of it's water. Today, we've explored somewhere around 95, uh, we've explored about 5% of that world under the sea, so meaning 95% of the planet that we live on, the underwater part of that, is unexplored, totally unexplored. And uh, you know, again, the part of the issue there is that you just can't go out and rent a submarine or, or to go to the bottom of the ocean, especially when it's two miles deep, so we have to have technology to be able to do that. This is a map of the Earth where we take, uh, flatten out the globe, take a look at the Earth, and it's an amazing place what we've seen in that 5%. We see the world's greatest mountain range, the Mid-Ocean Ridge, 50,000 miles long, winds its way around the Earth like the seams on a baseball. We find thousands of valleys wider and deeper than the Grand Canyon. We find underwater rivers, underwater rivers. We find underwater lakes. We find underwater waterfalls under the sea. We find more life than we ever thought could exist, all in that 5% that we've seen so far. I mentioned technology. You know, one of the most dramatic, dramatic and romantic ways to explore the ocean is a submarine. And this is the ship Atlantis that we have at Woods Hole Oceanographic, part of the National Deep Submergence Facility. That's our submarine Elvin. And, and it's an amazing uh, gadget for technology. Three people get in there, and, and off they go to the bottom of the ocean. And this is a great spot on deck, a great moment, lots of excitement. 50 people on that ship, everyone focused on launching the submarine. Three people inside there, all about, all asking the same question, should I have gone to the bathroom one more time? <laughs> because it's a 10-hour trip in that sub. And there you are off the sub, and you know, when you get to this spot, that lovely color Jacques Cousteau blue penetrates your very spirit. It's an amazing moment. The sound of the surface ship fades away, all that machinery. You start to hear the pinging of the sonar on the submarine down to the bottom and back up. You have divers that check out the sub, and then once they're sure everything's in, in right condition, they give you the go-ahead, press the button, and down you go. And for two and a half hours, you're 
free falling through the ocean, pretty much drifting down, two and a half hours. First half an hour through the light blue, deep blue, dark blue, and then for two hours, positively pitch black. And you know, it's an amazing thing, and, and yes, robots do a more efficient job catch, uh, collecting data, but nothing can, uh, make, uh, can, can uh, simulate that experience of actually being in that world. Like I said, we were positive uh, about that world, that world of darkness. We were positive that because it was pitch black, no sunlight, there'd be no life at all. But instead, when we go there, we find incredible animals. And uh, this one, particular one, I'll call it a jellyfish. It's a siphonophore. It's about eight inches long. Uh, it's got all sorts of stomachs. It's got fishing lures. It's got stinging tentacles, some jet thrusters up in the tip of it. So it's only about that long, but fully grown, can be wider, longer than this room can be over 100 feet long, can be one of the largest animals in the ocean. But that's an animal that if you tried to collect it in a net, and we've tried in the past, it'll fall apart. So if you've never seen it before, if you're exploring for the first time, you have no clue about what that animal really is. Same thing with these animals. So when we look in that dark blanket of ocean, we find that it's absolutely full of life. Life really does want to happen. It's not just about sunlight. So there's something else going on inside the ocean. And to us, it's incredibly, incredibly exciting. So you go all the way through that part of the ocean and free fall down to the bottom. And when you get to the bottom, there's things, there's, there's sediments from the earth, but also the record of human history is there in those sediments. Sometimes it comes in big clumps. Titanic's one of those big clumps. And we've spent a lot of time exploring Titanic. This is the bow of Titanic, uh, taken on one of our most recent exp expeditions. That's where Jack was king of the world. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> You know, Titanic, we didn't go there to, to make a documentary. We go to Titanic because it's a test of our technology, and we're learning an incredible amount about the deep sea when we go to Titanic. It's about two and a half miles deep. There's organisms actually eating Titanic bacteria, actually eating the hull of Titanic. We're learning a lot about the ship and the shipwreck itself. That's great for historians and, and the like. But we're also learning how to work around something that's very dangerous to work around. There's a lot of jagged edges. There's cables. Uh, so there's a lot of great stuff to see, but the process of how do you go to a shipwreck that's deep in the ocean and collect all that data and bring it back is really something that we have to learn, and we learn something new every time we go to Titanic. The ultimate goal, this is a picture that's drawn by Ken Marshall, an incredible artist. And these are the pictures that captured the imagination of the public when the Titanic was found in 1985. But that's our goal, is to have the technology so we can make this digital image of Titanic not only because it's better for scientists to be able to explore that way, to have a whole image, uh, but, it, but it allows us to get it online so all of you can explore Titanic from the comfort of your home or office or laboratory. So that's one of our goals, is virtual Titanic. I want to show you this picture, this nighttime image uh, with lights lighting up that puddle of water that you see in the, in the uh, foreground. There's some sand around it, and then you see some rocks on either side. Uh, I'll zoom in on that water. There's that water. You see the ripples in it. Well, that water is at the bottom of the ocean. So what you're looking at there is a small pool of water. And the reason I show this is because uh, it's so crisp and clear. This is some work done by Bob Ballard and his team in the Gulf of Mexico. But look at that. I mean, it's a, it's a perfect interface. It's not diffuse. There's waves in it. There's animals that live in there. There's animals that live along the edge of it that don't go in that water. There's animals that live in that water that don't come up into the ocean. It's a lake beneath the sea. Some of them are big, 10 miles by one mile, 300 feet deep. We never thought we'd find lakes beneath the sea till we looked. A lot of things we never thought about uh, existing till we actually stumbled across them. This is one of the big ones, and, and uh, many of you may have heard of these before, but they're called hydrothermal vents. And it looks like smoke coming out of the seafloor. This is the top of that underwater mountain range. That stuff is toxic as you can get. It would kill us all in this room in a heartbeat. Uh, and you couldn't get a permit to dump that in the ocean if you tried. <laughs> but it's oozing out. It's that rotten, eggy stuff that's oozing out along the volcanoes of the Mid-Ocean Ridge. And because it's so deep, uh, because it's toxic, uh, because it's in the pitch black, uh, because the pressure there is the same kind of pressure, it would mangle the Titanic. A, a strong ship like Titanic, it would be just like ripping that up the Titanic up the way you could rip up a piece of paper into confetti in your hands. So we were positive there'd be no life at all there. And instead, one day, stumbling around the bottom looking at volcanic rocks, uh, geologists came into a, a, an area like this where they found communities of life. 
Everything you see there, that's a pillar that's about 30 feet tall, and it's full of animals, and they're all really weird animals. The white things are called tube worms. They've got red tips that's like a hemoglobin in the tip. There's crabs, there's clams, there's mussels, there's shrimp. In one place, 300 species of animals, 297 never been seen before because they're all really weird, almost alien life forms, living not off the sun, but pretty much off those, that chemical stuff coming out of the ocean. Okay, there's microbe that loves to eat the toxic chemicals and the microbes turn the toxicity into sugars for these, these bigger animals here. In terms of diversity and density, there's more life here than the tropical rainforest. So we were dead wrong about life on Earth. Dead wrong about life on Earth. And so now we know differently. But it wasn't because we predicted it. It wasn't, didn't fall out of some formula. It's because we decided to explore for the first time and then we see these beautiful things. Now, not everything new was happening in the deep ocean. You know, Yogi Berra, that great philosopher, said, you can observe a lot just by watching. And even in shallow water, <laughs> This is one of my friends, Roger Hanlon, and Roger studies how animals can camouflage themselves, cephalopods, octopus and squid. And there's a big octopus hiding here. You see some algae and stuff up in the foreground. And then uh, you'll see him, and there you go. That's his eye. And notice when he gets seen by Roger, up comes the cloud of ink, he scoots away. And then he says, oh, Roger's in hot pursuit. So he spreads out his body and tries to bluff by making his eye spot really big. But we're going to run this back slow in slow motion. So watch what you've got here. This is an octopus that's about that big, smooth skin, light colored. So that animal that you see on the right has got to turn into that stuff you see on the left. And it's got to do it like that. And the way it does it is by changing his color, changing his texture of his skin. So there he goes. Absolutely amazing. And again, it didn't, well, no one ever predicted this. You know, we had to go see it. Even in shallow water, diver depth water, snorkeling water is, is that. So we're finding out new stuff. It all turns out to be really important because, you know, it's not just about the planet being fascinating, but there's 7 billion of us living on this planet. And it always amazes me that we have this relationship with the ocean, regardless of where you live. If it's Dallas, if it's uh, Kansas, if it's Cape Cod, Boston, Tokyo, China, Africa, uh, every single day, the things that impact your life, hurricanes, floods, droughts, weather patterns, tsunamis, uh, they get, it gets their energy from the sea. The ocean impacts you no matter where you live. You impact the ocean no matter where you live. Whatever we put into the air, whatever we put onto the grounds eventually makes its way down to the sea. We never knew that before, but now we do. We're influencing the ocean. So you know, even though you can't see us on this map, seven billion of us, we're changing, like a, like a virus, we're changing the temperature and we're changing the chemistry of the ocean. Now we know, so we've got to walk that back and get on the right, right track. Um, some of the things to remind us about how powerful the ocean is, Sandy, you know, but that, but that took us by surprise, right? I love these things like Sandy where we said we never thought, we didn't know. Uh, the tsunami, uh, the earthquake and tsunami in Japan, same thing, you know, we never expected. Well, you know, we better start expecting. Uh, because there are times that we, when we have to go at the bottom of the sea and do some work. Uh, Deepwater Horizon was one of those. You know, it drove me crazy that we were driving submarines around the surface, of, driving robots around the surface of Mars, but we couldn't plug a leak in our own backyard that was only about a mile deep. And that's why I show it here as this monster on the bottom of the Kraken on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, because for months we had this monster loose that really was just the, the form of a leaky pipe. You know, and, and the, the amount of people, oil companies are great at getting oil out of the deep ocean, they're fantastic. But once that oil gets into the environment, there's very few groups that know about that, okay? So, so we, were, uh, we were really caught by surprise then. Also, you know, there's many, many planes cross the oceans and we're always taught that planes don't just fall out of the skies, that's what we're told. Uh, this plane did just fall out of the sky and it fell right down on top in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, as far away from any place. It was going from Rio to Paris and it landed, in fact, somewhere around the top of that underwater mountain range. In order to figure out what happened to this plane, there were no witnesses, there was no reporting. Uh, it was a total mystery, just dropped out of sight. We had to find the black boxes. They're actually orange, there's two of them. But so the mission was to find two shoe boxes uh, in something more rugged than the Rocky Mountains only at nighttime, basically with flashlights. Uh, so we had, that was the mission. And the reason I tell you that is because the technology is good enough these days, the teams are talented enough that we did find that plane in those black boxes, even though it seemed impossible. We can get the answers if we have the will and decide to do this. We can understand how this planet's changing. 
I want to show you just a couple more things. There's the Earth again. Uh, it, it comes down to this. I said the Earth is changing. Uh, the face of the Earth, the climate changes. It's been doing it for five billion years. We have had an impact. We have changed the chemistry of the atmosphere. We have changed the chemistry and temperature of the, of the oceans. You know how I know that? is if you go to the middle of the ocean, catch a fish, look at the stomach contents, more likely than not, you'll find little bits of plastic in there. If you go to the middle of the ocean, catch a fish, look at the flesh, you'll find things like flame retardants, pesticides, nutrients. You'll find the record of humanity, just stuff that dripped off our continents. Uh, and in fact, usually in the form of clear water, not oil spills, but stuff that just washes off our coast, you'll find that in the ocean. You know, we've been watching the ocean acidity changing. We're making, turning the oceans more and more acidic because the oceans absorb carbon dioxide. And that's human stuff. That's stuff that comes right out of our smokestacks. You know, that, and, and so the problem there is it's making life difficult uh, for any kinds of animals that change to acidity uh, for any kind of animals that want to make their shells or, or their, their, uh, their uh, skeletons out of seawater. So, but that's our doing. And now again, time not to panic, but time to walk it back. I said before, you can't see us on this map. During the daytime, you can't, but at nighttime, there we are. And uh, that's not easy to see, but those are the lights of Earth at night. And if you want to know what we're doing on this planet, that's a great way to look, because you see the lights of the developed world, you see the lights of the developing world, uh, you see the gas flares from oil uh, exploration and production. Uh, but the most important thing on there in Africa, up through the Middle East and into China, there's a lot of gold dots. Those gold dots are amazing to me because it's not electric lighting, it's not the 60 hertz stuff we've got here. It's, it's, it's village campfires, village fires that they're, where they're actually burning solids uh, to cook food, burning solids for heat, burning solids for, for, uh, 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 for life, to, to sustain life. And what amazes me is that on this world that I call the ocean planet, in that area, there's about a billion, billion and a half, two billion, depending on, on how you count it, people clinging to the edge of life. Why? Because they don't have fresh water or sanitary water. And, and for the longest time at Woods Hole, we said, how can we be living on the ocean planet and have so many people not have fresh water? How is that possible? And so we took all the water off the earth and had a look at this, and this is what we ended up with. So what you're looking at there is the earth on, on the left side. Take all the water off it. It's that, it's that sphere on the, just to the right of it. So if the earth was the size of a basketball, and take all the water off it, all the water on the earth will fit into a ping pong ball. And that's amazing. And you say, Dave, how? You said 70%. Yeah, I said the surface was covered 70% with ocean. And I also said that it was average depth two miles. But think of the Atlantic Ocean. It's 3,000 miles by two miles thick. The Pacific Ocean, 10,000 miles by two miles thick, thinner than paint. The layer of water on this earth is thinner than paint. And the most amazing thing, that's all the water. The fresh water is that tiny little point to the right of that. That fresh water is what makes us tick and animals like us. We need that fresh water. That comes out of the sea. The oceans give us the air we breathe. Every other breath of fresh air you take, you can thank the oceans for uh, uh, because the oxygen comes out of the ocean. The food we eat, no matter how you count it, if it's seafood or food that's transported across the sea, the food you eat, and the water you drink, because rainfall patterns, that's that little speck, and it's got to go in just the right places, just the right amounts, at just the right time of year, or, we, or things start to get really complicated for us. There's a quote by Marcel Proust. It goes like this. The true voyage of exploration is not so much in seeking new landscapes, which we are doing, but in having new eyes. And to me, the new eyes is allowed in the oceans through technology. And our challenge is to take that, those, that technology, have those new eyes, and start to think about this planet differently. Thank you very much.